You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BH app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. For some people, yours truly included, photography is a solitary endeavor. They prefer to photograph quiet landscapes or perhaps work in a studio. For others, the interaction with people is the heart and soul of the photographic process. Approaching people in the street on the spur of instinct, often strangers sharing greetings with them and hopefully capturing a small glimpse of their world at that moment in time is the goal. But getting folks to agree to be photographed or to be photographed in the manner that the photographer envisions often takes a bit of convincing, at the very least, a bit of trust. How we get to that moment of trust is the topic of today's conversation. Amy Touchet is a Brooklyn-based photographer who explores themes of social interconnectedness through street portraiture. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the New York Observer, and Esquire, and has been exhibited throughout the world. She is represented by Clamp Art in New York and has had an incredible series, Street Dailies, which in our humble opinions is the type of series Instagram was designed for. She's also a past guest on our show. Welcome back. Thank One you. more time, you get a free T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would love yeah. That. We just had some return from the laundry, so we'll get one to you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> one Alan. <laughs> <laughs> one of my yeah. <laughs> Ready Roy is a Jamaican-born documentarian and also a Brooklyn Brooklyn right now. Okay, yes, all right. He's a photojournalist and a street photographer, and above all, a humanist. He's a member of the Seven Photo Agency. He's a fo- he's a Fujifilm X photographer, and his work has appeared in Time, National Geographic, Vogue. Ebony and Jet and the New York Times. A series he photographed on Hurricane Sandy survivors on Instagram and another series titled When Living is a Protest are two projects for which he's received well-deserved attention. Welcome, Amy. Welcome, Ruddy. Welcome to the show, folks. Thank you. Um, Street photography is something that, personally speaking, I used to be real good at. I had no problem going over to people and just charming them and photographing them. And I have become so less prone to doing that now for a lot of reasons. I think a lot has to do with the fact that times have changed, people have changed, and there's a level of suspicion and maybe a lack of trust off the bat that is responsible for that on my side and on the other side. What are your thoughts? Because you you guys, this is what you do. You go over to people and you enter their worlds. Ooh. Well, I disagree. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no, I it's think about me, I feel like that's why it's more important than ever for me to have that experience with people because there is a lot of distrust in the air and I can't live that way. And actually I've, you know, I photograph people with their permission and without and various situations occur as a result. But most of the time people are really fantastic and and if you're if you have good intentions and you're not up to no good you're fine and actually you're going to meet someone really that will teach you things and probably entertain you and like wish you well by the time it ends and i just feel like i need to keep having that experience. Well, when nodded. you said intention, you nodded. And, um, yeah. How do you, how do you get that attention, that intention to people? Um, I think everything that Amy said is, is right on the money. Um, however, photographing on the street and, and finding pushback has always been home court advantage. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm and I, I'm, I, I'm saying that to say, you know, being a black man on the street, there's always the potential of of distrust. Um, one of my students challenged me recently to go to the Upper East Side and photograph more mature women, you know, women over a certain age. And it was tough. It was the toughest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, however, um, someone also said that when I photograph in Jamaica or Africa, that my images are different. Um, and I think it's because I don't have to go through so many barriers to get to what is my intent. 
Um, that's the one thing that has not changed. Even though people ha have changed, my intent has stayed the same. I am about telling a story, a particular story. And uh, it's the same generic story that I've woven from Jamaica to, to Nepal, to Congo, to Brooklyn. Uh, and so, in a way, it it nullifies the pushback because white, black, pink, purple, Chinese, whatever we're talking about, when I say to you, I'd like for you to be a part of my story or this story that I'm telling, people become curious. They want to know what is the story that you're trying to tell. Is, and, is that how you phrase it when you go over to people? I'd like to tell, I'd like, um, there's, I'm doing this series or I'm doing this story that I'd, I'd like for you to be a part of. Mm. I, that's, I like that approach. It's interesting. Because that, that has to be an icebreaker right there. I mean. But do you say your story or you say, I'd like to tell your story, you know, to the people. A story. story. A story. Yeah. A story. And, 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 and I'd like for you to help me mm. to tell that story. Mm. And did you use is that the same approach you used on the Upper East Side, uh, um, more or less? They weren't listening to me. I mean, they, were, they literally ran. Uh. You know, I, I, I'm glad you brought this up because John and I were talking earlier. We're looking at all the questions. Yeah, there's something that I have to deal with here in that. We're talking about street photography and approaching strangers, okay? And if you approach me out of the blue with a camera, okay? And I really can't say that now because there's a warmth in your eyes, man. So it blows all these you, things. You would say yes. <laughs> okay. you, you would definitely do it, okay? But having you first approach me and having Amy approach me, okay? All right, now, a Caucasian female and a black male, when you're approached off the bat, just the street instinct goes into play initially. I think that, and that, that's a hard one to overcome. But I would imagine, and you confirmed that, you would have a harder time in many places than Amy would approaching people. Because just looking at the work that you both do, all right, I mean, Amy, you have a real mixed bag. You, you approach, it seems, everybody, okay? But right, your work is more people of color. There are white people in there, okay? But it's less so. And is that because you have an easier time breaking through, or is that because you're shaking your head no? Please elaborate. It's where my palate is. Okay. Um, I, I was asked the same question in Vermont, and it was a student, and I, I said to them, have you seen my work for the past four days? And they were like, not really. I said, go look. And they opened up their phone in an audience of maybe 80 people, and they opened up their phone, and the, the, the four days, I was in Vermont, and they were white folks, and they were like, stumped. And I go, I photograph where I'm at. It's a diary. I, I'm, if I'm in, I'm in Brooklyn, I'm in Bed-Stuy, um, although there's a lot of new faces, but the story I'm telling is, is specific. Um, and I, ha I have seen challenges where I'm like, you know, do I want to tell a gentrification story? If I'm going to tell the gentrification story, I want to tell a particular gentrification story because for me, gentrification is not a hundred percent bad. Um, with with new faces come new resources, new possibilities, new better schools, better. So it's not completely bad. So why would I want to tell a story that can be ha a half truth? So the gentrification is story is not my story. My story is the stories that I grew up with. It's so funny. I'm, I'm saying this because um, <laughs> I've I've been thinking about it the whole week. Somebody said that what I do is I engage in misery porn. Oof. And normally, I have a very tough shell. But I'm also a very humble person. Like I'm like, you say something to me, and depending on what it is, I'll either let you know with my eyes that you should move, <laughs> or I'm going to go away and become introspective. Like... Maybe they're, I'm coming out every day thinking that I'm wearing a red shirt, but I'm actually wearing a blue one. So let me look in the mirror again. And that's what I did. It, didn't, it still didn't make sense. I'm like, there's a long caption. It's there what I'm trying to do. But still, this person, Khalil, Khalil Poole, was very specific about the fact that I'm trying to disguise all my images through this idea of misery porn. And so... I spend days with it, uh, and I don't want to take up the, the no, time. I'm, I'm, I spend days trying to figure out why he said that, more so than anything else, why. And I remember I had to go to Fuji to drop off some, some equipment, and I was driving to Jersey, 
and I was listening to old reggae music. And every song, and we're talking about, I'm listening to music from 1976, which would make me seven or eight, seven or eight years old. First line, I need a roof over my head. The next song, anything that Bob sings, um, Dennis Brown, do you know what it means to have a revolution? And I'm listening to, and I'm like, they're singing about, about misery. And if this is my platform, it is no wonder that I'm attracted to, to these images. And maybe I'm not a photographer or a writer. Maybe I've always been a reggae singer <laughs> pushing these songs through a camera. And it gave me so much peace to come to that realization that how I grew up, the songs I listened to, the art I saw, the books I read, influenced what I do now as a photographer. Every reggae music during the 70s, every song was about the misery that people went through. And so I found peace after that drive. Mm. I've had a similar experience where it's like I am just n not just in a diminutive way, but I am a, a, this specific person and I'm not anything else. And once you know that, it just makes life more peaceful, you know, and, and, and maybe certain things are disappointing to find out about yourself. But after a while, it's it's sort of fantastic because then you have this sort of focus all right, what, what am I good at? You know, I, I, I was born into this body, this white female, and I was raised outside of Syracuse. And I had, a, you know, a, a very comfortable upbringing. And I'm American and on and on and on. I could say more and more about who I was. But what does that mean? I have no clue if I don't meet other people. I have no clue I'm in this total bubble of this this person I just put all these labels on. When I realized photography was, for me, it was because it allowed me to see all these other people, like to provide this context for me. I feel like I'm just taking impressions of people. I want to meet as many people as possible. I want to look at as, ma as many people in the eye as possible. So they're very shallow. They're impressions, you know, like I'm not under this impression that I'm capturing people's souls. No, mm -hmm. I, I don't interview people. I don't have them sign model releases. <laughs> it's a very quick interaction. And sometimes it's like literally, you know, one, one twenty-fifth of a second. And other times when I'm with my Roloflex, yes, I introduce myself. We talk for a couple of minutes, but for the most part, you know, people are like, let's, they, they want to move on. And I don't, I don't, I don't have more questions in a way. Like I just wanted to Say hello. <laughs> so, I, 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 like str I struggled with my alcoholic dad, um, and more so after his death than when he was alive. When he was alive, I ignored him. Mm. And so I love the word impressions. Love it. Um, for me, the, the, the idea is, and let me go back to the story. Um, when I went to bury him, his nails were long. And he was somebody who was beautiful, well-groomed, um, had an afro. I tried to get an afro. It couldn't work. <laughs> um, but I went back home, and in the morgue, he had very long nails, and I ignored it. I refused to groom him. And it's the one thing that haunts me to this day, that I didn't cut his nails. Because that's something he want, he would have wanted to. And so for me, when I decided to indulge, to, to shoot on a tripod at a 15th of a second, a longer exposure, um, it was about not necessarily capturing their soul, but for me, a deeper understanding of the man. Most of the people I photograph are men, black men. For that reason, I want to know why my mother why my mother said to my sister and I at 15 and 13 that it would be better if you went than my father. What it is about this misery that a woman would cling to and say to her kids that I prefer to see you guys go than him. And it took me until I was 20 to realize that my mom wasn't really saying that 
she's going to kick us out, but that you guys are going to leave anyway. And it, it's, again, maturity. It's, it's, it's seeing all these men in my community and wondering, what's their story? Like, I know my story. I'm, I'm still trying to, to figure out who he is, who he was. But what is yours? And so th- those, are, those are the places, because it's so easy to, 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 to say that's a, that's a, a bum or that's a, a vagrant. I've actually seen a, a photographer use the word vagrant on his website. He said vagrants on somewhere in Newark. And um, it hurt to see, to read the word vagrant. Your work, I mean, I, I would question that definition from the start, but that's, we'll, we'll just let it sit for now. Um, is the conversation essential to your work? Do you, when you have, the, when you take the photograph, is a conversation something that has to happen? Only because of the way black images have always been viewed and analyzed over the centuries. Um, if you look at what, what the black image has been, it has been prostitutes or sexualized or thugs or buck or... Poverty, misery. Right. Are, um, Africa. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember mm-hmm. being in Ethiopia and yeah. listening to students tell me that the camera is seen to have the same power as a gun. Mm-hmm. Like it is, it is not something that is, is celebrated the way I was like celebrating my little camera. Um, I walk down the street with a camera and Ethiopians look at it as the destroyer, the thing that labeled them for 30 years, the face of poverty. And so I need to, to, to se- if I'm going to take a picture of anybody in this room, it is important that I send it out dressed. And that's how I see it, as opposed to naked, um, like without the, 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 the other um, it's just something I've gotten used to only because of what the iconography of black images. That's the only reason. Because I was thinking about this last night as I'm preparing for this talk. Um, I did not grow up with images of what, there was no such thing called beautiful images of black folk. I grew up in around black folk. I already saw beautiful black folk. So when I came here, I had to learn that there is that pla- there is that tier called beautiful images of black folk. It was just it was just images. When I studied, when I looked at images for the first time, it was Avedon, it was Pen. It I had to go ser- seek out Parks and um, Roy de Carava. I had to go seek them out, and I had to find Deb Willis. Um, I found myself in a group called Komonge, 25 black photographers, male and female, um, or men and women. And it was through that vehicle that I understood how the black image have had to find a rebirth. And so for me, it's knowing this history that I take images with this long caption. But your captions are so beautiful. I mean, if you didn't feel that you needed to provide that, you would have kept so much from us. I mean, your texts are, like, do they just come out? Are there I've, times when it's harder? No. Yeah, it doesn't I've, feel I've that write, way. I, I played music first. Uh-huh. And after music had its down, I wrote from it. And... Uh, I was in college and immigration told me to go home. And when writing went down, photography came from it. And again, it's through this journey that I married them. Um, But I'll sit down here and listen to everybody in this room and just find something to write. I'll hear different pieces and use it. Um, So writing writing was, I would say, my first wife. Um, I was just going to say that I'm listening to you and you are more of a uh, uh, a person of words, verbal and written. And the fact that you have very good photographs to accompany those words is secondary. We say in Jamaica, we say brata. Brata means extra, like okay. gravy. 
<laughs> ah, yeah, so, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so the, the image is the brat. Is, is that fair to say? Or do you consider yourself a photographer first? Um, I was in India doing an interview and then this reporter looked at me and she said, you know, I don't consider you a photographer. And I immediately sat up in my chair because <laughs> I was ready. She goes, no, I see you as a writer who takes pictures. Yeah. Well, Amy, you you were a writer or are a yeah, writer I to am some a degree, writer. but yeah, yeah. that's right. You don't. But I mean, I wasn't. I was, you know, of course, thinking about this in in terms of my experience. But I have a really hard time with captions, and um, so that's why I appreciate so much what you do because you know we often have to talk about our photos, or we often need to provide text for various reasons, and. Um, I always start at ground zero, you know, I'm always like, okay, what, I mean, there's so many things you can say. Um, but for me, yeah, photography is just like, it, it speaks my language better mm -hmm. than words. Mm -hmm. Let me jump back to what Alan was, was, was asking Ruddy and, and, and ask you the same question because you're, you often work in neighborhoods of color, of, you know, Hasidic neighborhoods. Do you find the same problems that Ruddy spoke about in the Upper East Side? Uh, do you, how do you break the barrier? How you do you photograph a lot of Hasidic right. people, uh, Orthodox Jews, and they tend to be more insular and do not like being photographed. They're not quite Amish, but, you know, there, there is that thing about it. Yeah. <sighs> yet, I've, yet, yet all the expressions on their faces seem to be okay. I've, I've, I've seldom, if ever, seen one of your pictures of... of any other group, ethnic group, where there's a look of suspicion uh, in their eyes. It seems to be okay. Yeah, well, I mean, pictures are just fleeting moments, yeah. right? So you can you can decide that you know how they feel from the picture I show you, or, you know, that could be a total lie to what the person was actually feeling. But no, I mean, this is something that is so at the fore for me as a photographer right now. I don't photograph to hear myself talk. Like, I'd much rather shine the light in other people. I basically have nothing to say, you know. Like, a lot of my friends are earbenders, you know. It's like not by accident. <laughs> like, I'm... And, you know, in the same way that I mean, like, listen with my ears, for me as a photographer, it's like listening with my eyes and listening with my, my whole body. Like, there's, like, vibes in the air, you know. If you get used to trying to sense them then like they're everywhere and it's really interesting place i have a question for both of you uh you could fight it out for who answers first your pictures tend to be a blend of spontaneous grab shots of interesting imagery that you capture if your eyes are open and your finger is ready on the button and a mixture of that and formal sit down obviously conversation where you stopped and you had a connection and a dialogue with the person you are photographing what percentage are grab shots? Which percentage are sit down, let's talk, I want to know this person and, and, and capture something after? Uh, and which is more satisfying? 80 20. Um, In favor, 80? 80 portraits. Okay. And 20% grab. Okay. Um, and how many of those grab shots end up being a connection at where you stop and then you first start talking and maybe lead to another photograph? Um, a higher percentage. Okay. Um, I've, I've, I have 4,400 images on Instagram that I put up. Um, and recently this year they did the 10. So there's actually more. Mm -hmm. They just call the first one, the entry. I've had maybe 10 no's and I'm pushing that number. It could be six. No, people saying, no, I don't want to be photographed. Um, because I'm, I'm, there's, is there certain, I mean, like Amy is perfect because she says a lot of stuff that have, have me thinking. I, I don't approach anybody as a black man. I approach them as a human. Mm -hmm. And there's something that you said, if you are in tuned with seeing if your body sees, not just your eyes, if you feel, if you know that what you're actually dealing with are energies and vibrations, then you're not going there for a no. Mm -hmm. Even when you're grabbing, the person will turn, see that you grabbed, and smile. 
because they know the image you got. They could feel that moment with you. And that leads to a conversation. So. Good. Amy, what about you? Well, I photograph every day with my iPhone, and those are all without permission. Those are the things that that comprises street dailies. Those are those portraits. So I really like eye contact, so I just like wait for them to look my direction or um, look my way. And then from like May to September, I bring my Roloflex out. Um, I've just like started working with the seasons, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, and it just really works for me. So from May to September, I'll, I'll engage with people. But again, it's pretty, it's like two frames, you know, for one, I'll give them slight direction. For the second, I'll give them maybe a little more, but usually I kind of let them present how they want to present. Do your tools direct the nature of the, of the photograph? Absolutely, absolutely. So after, right. let's say you've taken one with your eye, with your iPhone and, and the eye contact's been made after the photo, um, what, what do you say? Or what do they say? Or what? I mean, I usually say nothing. You? That's that kind of street photography. You mm-hmm. know, like it's more of a traditional approach where you don't, you don't really but, have that contact. If you have that contact, you're more of like a portrait photographer. But or, don't, you, don't you feel when, when the eye contact's been made that there, even if you don't say something, there has to be some recognition that you took the photo, whether it's just a smile or... Not necessarily. Not at all. People are busy, man. They're yeah. not, you know... And they, everyone's on their phone anyway. Mm-hmm. Some people don't know I'm taking a picture. They don't know if I'm making, taking a selfie. It's actually getting back to Alan's first point about trust and, and this idea of the phone. I, obviously, phones being everywhere is maybe a favor for street photographers because we can get away with things. I, I, I think I should jump in here and tell, and, tell, and, tell, and, tell, and, tell, and tell Amy that the hood knows when you're taking a picture. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I yeah. don't think people I don't. don't think just a hood. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I for sure, yeah. some people Most know, some people don't care, some people do care. You yeah, know, right. I mean, I get every single kind of response. Mm-hmm. Because I, I mean, when I was, there was a time when I, all I took were um, iPhone images. And it, be, it, I don't want to say it became too easy, but I I started to develop ways to take images surreptitiously, just like, and I remember this dude, when I said dude, you know what I mean, like, he was like, you know I know you took my picture, and I'm like, how you know that? And at the time I didn't, mm. I was trying to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was waiting for the moment. <laughs> And he goes, because, and he actually used psychology. He said, people who know when they're in this neighborhood, when your phone is up, they cover the camera with their finger. And so any any uncovered camera, we know that you're taking our picture. And so I was like, street lesson. Yeah. Good to know. That's fantastic. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's why the Roloflex, that's why I like wor- working with both of these tools because some places it's more appropriate to use your Roloflex, you know, and I would say bed has been one of those places, um, except I feel like there are just so many pitfalls for me in these conversations, but um, except for like the Hasidic community, like there are, there are communities, also the Polish community in Greenpoint, they would not let me take their picture with my Roloflex and I ask and I'll continue to ask and so I take it with my iPhone. Have you said, okay, you know, a year has gone by, I've gotten a bunch of no's. Um, Let me try something different. I I guess what I'm trying to get at is kind of back in the... You're always sort of refining that Mm -hmm. talk. Mm -hmm. Your script. Or the the vibe you bring, you know, like... Um, I'm always refining that and it's always a new situation. It's always a new day, even if it's a neighborhood that you're really familiar with. Mm-hmm. The, everyone is new. Every mm-hmm. person is a new person, mm-hmm. you, you know, so. Let's say you're walking down the street and you see somebody on the other side of the street and you want to take that picture or you want to, you want to get that person's story. You want, you want, you want that image. Um, what do you do? I mean, what's, what, w- <laughs> and I understand the idea of vibe eye contact, body language, all these things are part of it. But how, how much of the process is conscious? How much you say, okay, I'm going to go take this picture. Let me, let me get ready. Let me think what I'm going to say. Um, get into character. Let, whatever you want to call yeah. it. I mean, is, is there something that you guys can talk to about that? Uh, uh, go ahead. Um, it's, it's, it's a conscious 
act, an intentional act, a purposeful act for me. Usually, it's not just the person. It's also the environment. Mm -hmm. It's a word. It's mm -hmm. something on a wall. It's, it's the a, light. It's, it's the, the light. Or whatever it happens to be. Sure. And so I'll post myself there and I'll wait mm -hmm. for somebody to walk through that space that I want to use. Um, it could be a word. And I'll sit and I'll wait. It could be, they might come, I might see them coming together. Um, and I do that. I, if, if there's such a thing called a skill outside of listening, looking, one of the things I do well is I can reference an image. Like I know that Avedon did it, so let me walk 10 miles away from it. I can see it coming. Or uh, Winograd did it. But I can push past the, the border that he had it and push through. And so I'll see these two images coming together and I'll race over and I'll know exactly when to go and I'm done. Um, and I do that almost every day. Like, but there's also certainties like waking up on Easter Sunday, seeing my two boys playing the video game and and going, I could never get away with this at my house. Like Easter Sunday was reverent. And I was wondering, should I tell my, should I teach my son the Easter story? And I watched them playing video games and I, I remember walking out of the house, I'm gonna go look for an Easter picture. And I walked on Fulton Street, walked past this guy who had a Bible, he was homeless. And I was just like, again, Kaleem Poole was in my head, so I was not trying to do a misery image. I walked by the guy. He had a Bible beside him. And I walked half a block, turned around, walked back up to him. And the week before, I was in, in Pennsylvania photographing mentally challenged individuals. And so there's certain skills, certain things that I learned while I was there. I was actually in the institution. So I saw this, and the first thing I said was, can he have a conversation with me? Because if he can't, I'm not going to take this picture. And I introduced myself, and I asked him, do you have that Bible there? Because it's Easter Sunday. And he smiled. And it wasn't just a smile. It was a how you know smile. A knowing smile. Yeah, yeah and I'm like... Hmm, we're about to have a conversation. He goes, do you follow the Ten Commandments? And I'm like, oh God, here mm. we go. <laughs> and I go, kind of. And he goes, have a seat. I'm about to give you a lesson. The, the script got flipped. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And he just went into asking me about the commandments. And each one, I, I told him why I didn't believe in it or why I believed in it. And the last thing he said was, the creator just does not exist in church alone. Like, the creator is all around us. We're talking about a supposedly homeless, mentally ill person. Mm -hmm. That's what he portrayed. That's what he looked like. And I'm sitting on there as this dude. And I go, so what's your name? And he goes, Fisher. With that same smile. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So I'm walking off thinking, either this dude grew up in the church the way I grew up in the church. I knew that he should use the word fisher, as in Christ, fisher of men. Or he's really something else. And so how can that story, how can that image be surreptitiously shot? Because I did. I mean, I shot him from afar and walked in. And that's usually how I, that's, that, was, that was how I graduated or left the iPhone. It was just, I, I was just, it was just too easy. I, and it took away some, a skill that I want to always have. And that is, I want to have this conversation. I want to be able to put my, my camera up and have, and be able to comfortably take the image without the looks, without. And so I photographed him from afar and walked in with the camera um, and then sat. And from that to that, I think, is the lesson. 
how does anybody get from 12 feet to three feet and shoot that journey? And it's, it's, it has been my journey. Um, that's, that's how I enjoy shooting. Wow. We're going to take a short break, breathe some pure oxygen, uh, uh, clear out our souls a bit, and be back with Amy and Ruddy. Stay tuned. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Okay, we are back with Amy and Ruddy. Um, here's a question for you guys. Um, obviously, for you guys, you're our guests. Cameras. I know that this is a big thing with the kind of photography you do. Now, most of you, both of you are shooting predominantly close range. You're within, you know, talking distance most often of the photographs that you're taking. I find that the choice of camera affects how people react to you. I know that a zillion years ago, I, I used to photograph around Coney Island a lot and used all kinds of cameras. My favorite camera and the one I got the best people pictures was a tiny little 35 millimeter Minox it looked like a toy with a little drop down during the length. It was a 38 millimeter lens, nothing fancy. People loved it. I said, that's a toy, isn't it? I go, no, it's a real camera. Can you, take, can you take my picture with it? It became an icebreaker. A Roloflex does the same thing because it's sort of a-, a For sure. It's a, a throwback. It's different. It, yeah. it's a, it, it makes people- It's a picture opener in many exactly. ways for me. Yeah, it really works in my favor. Yeah. Now, you take an average Canon or a Nikon or something like that, great cameras, but you hold it up to your face. First of all, they're not seeing your face anymore, and then you got that long hood, and it becomes more of uh, an intrusive device as opposed to, say, a Roly or uh, a, a phone. What are your thoughts? I mean, would, would you approach anybody with a DSLR or these tools that just don't speak the right language or the best. I mean, every photographer's got their thing, yeah. you know, and, and there are some super gentle people who could make the DSLR picture, you know, so it's just like one element, you know, and, and you just find what works for you. Like it's, it's going to make an impression just like everything else that you bring when that interaction starts. I mean, to me, a roll of just makes you open and vulnerable. Whereas you have an element of protection when you're looking through that finder and holding this box in front of your face. Well, I mean, I feel when, when you, you know, you you have your camera out, you have it around your neck, you know, half of the conversation has already started. If you walk up to somebody, they generally know, they know what, what you're what's up to. Okay. Yeah. Um, so breaking out the camera is another you know, hump you got to get over. Um, so do you guys, you guys carry your camera? I know you, well, with your iPhone, it's a different story, right? Because usually it's in a pocket. Yeah, before, no, I mean, um, no, usually my iPhone's right here. Right there, I kind of yeah. walk around yeah, with yeah. it in my palm because... Yeah. Like it's there for those in between moments in my mind. Like that's what it's so good for. Like when I, um, but I also, you know, the Roloflex experience like really balances out like every, all of like those qualities of the iPhone that you were just talking about, Ready, are so there for me too. I know exactly what you're talking about. Like there's sort of a shallowness, there's an emptiness to photographing with an iPhone that I feel like I really need to counter with my Roloflex. I love that it's there and it can be surreptitious. I love that. I use it for that. But it's also, it's super fleeting. You know, it's pretty much like I only really look them in the eye in the photo. Like I have this memento, you know. For me, like this conscious and unconscious like approach like, of course, R like, Reddy's just such an amazing, like, righteous guy with, you know, all this huge heart, and he wants the story, and it's just, like, it's super lovely. For me, it's more like, um, I think Joel Meyerowitz described it as, like, waves coming crashing down on you. So I have more of, like, an um, unconscious approach because I'll, I'll stay on the side that has the lighting that I prefer, and just keep walking. And so when I see someone I'm inspired to photograph, it's happening right away and I got to get the courage. I don't, I haven't formulated the words. I'm not even exactly sure what I'm excited about, but I've learned. I just have to like push that. So for me, it's, you know, all the thinking that I do, you know, I read a lot about photography. Of course, I look at a lot of photographs. I love speaking with other photographers. And when it comes time to actually photographing, like my mind's pretty out of it. I'm trying to be a slave to my feelings so in a way. Let me ask a question. When you say to somebody, uh, can I take your picture? And they say, why? 
what do you say? I mean, it may be different if you're you're in a newspaper or project. Already answered that. Yeah, you tell the truth. Yeah, I mean, like you're. I want. I'm working on this series. I'd like for you to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or for for me, it's just like you know, I. Um, the light, whatever it was, mm-hmm. the light was beautiful, or you looked so peaceful, or mm-hmm. just say it. Mm-hmm. It's there, mm-hmm. you know. Why? Why? And if the answer is no, you walk away. Totally. Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's so many people to photograph. There's no need mm-hmm. to dwell on, right. you know, someone. Someone doesn't want it. That's that's their prerogative. Do you, do you ever feel that? I'm sorry, but if you're doing it for a job, or if it's a newspaper assignment, the it changes. No, the dynamic has to change a bit. Yeah. Like a, a recent assignment I was working on, The Times, um, without going into the spe- specifics, um, daughter um, was home for the holiday and for the Easter holiday, and she hates pictures. There's no, there's hardly any picture of her in the house. But the story was about her, her, her brother, who is no longer with us. And she was not going to come back in time for me to photograph, for me to, for, for her to, for, for her to work up the courage. And I go, this is it. You know, there's only you and your sister. Mm-hmm. And I planted the seed in the beginning and I photographed around everything else I needed to photograph. And just before I left, I go, this would make, and so th- th- throughout the assignment, I make every image important, and I pointed to it. I said, "This is going to be fantastic. Wow. Yeah. This, and you hold on to the last piece, and the weight—I can call it guilt—but mm. <laughs> the weight of that was like, okay. But for me, it was more about." Making her see how important the story is Mm -hmm. and how each piece fit Mm. into making that story more Mm -hmm. and that she played a part in that. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I'm sorry. (laughs) 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 Ah, We're good at that. (laughs) Uh, That's a fault. Do either one of you ever get the feeling as you're working that you are actually taking advantage of these people? You're using them as props in your own Narrative? Never. Ever. Okay. Ever. Um, my intent looks like this. Okay. Um, and that, which is why normally a statement by Kaleem Poole would never bother me. It would never, because Ben Lowy, he and I have had these conversations over and over. And he would say to me, I could never take that image. And I go, then you need to check your reason. It is because misery, for lack of a better word, exists. I just can't pass it. I can't pass it. So I, I need to figure out what is my intent? Why? What, are you, what do you need this for? And if I can answer that question, I'm clicking. I just, I also believe in the healing powers of photography. So I might, there might be some people who are irked by me, but, you know, as a rule, I don't photograph people who are obviously going through a hard time or who are down and out. If I'm taking spontaneous, candid photographs, I don't go there. I only photograph people who are out in public, you know, not picking their nose or throwing up or, you know, I I just, you're really just very benign settings. Um, So I have that to bolster the feelings that I'm about to express. But I also feel like, I mean, history has proven that photographs are essential in knowing who we are and where we came from. And even the family album, Mm -hmm. we need photos. We need photos. And I will, you know, you could put that on my gravestone. Like we can just (laughs) end it here. Like I'm, I'm okay with if I if I've bothered a couple of people, mm-hmm. I don't love it. You know, <laughs> when things get hairy, it sucks. You know, I have to take a break and go get a diet coke because diet coke is like <laughs> ice cream or something. You know, like I don't drink. Anyway, you know, it's it's not easy, but but 
but I, you know, I, I know my intentions are good. It's just that you have to be able to express that to another yeah. person. Well, this is kind so. of the point of the show. That's, the word. that's, <laughs> that's, the word. that's kind of what I want to get at. Yeah. The intent. Yeah. Okay. For yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. That's how we started. Yeah. That's yeah. Back there. But, you know, yeah. people come, they've got their own thing going on. You don't exactly. know who you're talking to, what mind frame that they're in, wh- where they came from, what just happened to them. Um, all kinds of... Well, you both... Talk, I mean, you talked about it when, you know, the idea of the camera and a gun. I mean, everyone has a different uh, thought about what photography is to them. And, and you know, you guys are photographers. The intention is is good, clear. Not everybody feels that way. And uh, we, we, we associate cameras with spying. We associate them with money. So that's my next question. What if someone says, um, what if the money subject comes up? Are you going to pay me for this? Or, or what am I getting out of it? If there's, a, if there's a big rebuff, it's cool. I'll just move on. You know, I, I mean, I love that story that you, that you just told about, you know, when you're on assignment and you got this woman to allow you to photograph her. That's so lovely when you have that time with people. Like he had that opportunity because he could be in that space with her for a while. When you're on the street, it's not as controlled and people pretty much have some place to be, even if it's to go hang with their buddy. They don't really want to talk to, you know, some woman about her photo project. So I just move on, you know, I mean, I have had conversations where I've talked someone into allowing me to keep the candid photograph I just took. So I'll go there, but usually it's, you know, like it just, it ends pretty quickly, at least for me. But, but again, like I, I have a real, I have a real shallow street methodology, you know, like I'm really, I'm really about like quantity in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just want to see as much of the world as possible. So, yeah. So and photograph it, you know, so. All right. So there's not, I don't know how to phrase it. It's, it's a little bit of. It's like, okay, bye. Peace out. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, for sure. I'll, yeah, I'll have the conversation yeah. as long as they're, they're willing, willing to have it. Right. But I'm also not there to take, you know, like bring someone out of. Would you say that most of you, you, you kind of can read the situation pretty well? I mean, it, before you even ask. I mean, usually those conversations are why you're photographing anyway. Like to have these discussions is the purpose. Like mm-hmm. you get to meet all these people mm-hmm. and the photo is like, you know, but if the initial have, push, if, if the pushback is initial, you're, you're tending to cool. No problem. Yeah. yeah gonna, no problem. Like there's, to, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would like to, um, continue the conversation when people mistake my intention. I think that's when, I don't know if that's like the ego part or whatever, yeah. but it's just like, you know, I, I, I photograph a lot of children on the street. Like I am like a, you know, disciple of Helen Levitt. Like I, I don't have children of my own and I see so much joy with children running on the street and I want to photograph them. And, you know, I've encountered people who are like, you can't photograph children. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. I want to have that conversation like, okay, let's start it. You know, if, like, let's discuss what's happening here, you know? And does that work out? Sometimes and sometimes not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people doesn't matter, yeah. does do you, not matter, do you and so th- you know you, you you do have to move on, but not after a little heartache for sure. Hmm. What about if let's say the difference in approaching one person and let's say a group of guys? I mean, do you do you handle it differently? Do you try to find the one person who you feel you can communicate with in order to get the other folks there that may so you can get a, a group shot of some sort? You answer the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you find the one person find that one. you know that would influence everybody else. But usually usually try to avoid groups because there's also that one person who's like, nah, man, nah, nah, nah. And that influences how everybody else thinks. So. Yeah, but because I'm, I'm really into photographing groups, like with my Rolleiflex, I mostly photograph groups. And maybe part of it is because it is challenging. And especially challenging to like make a photo where everyone has, some, you know, something compelling that came across on the film. But um, it can also work in the reverse because that one person who's like, nah, and everyone else is in it, then he or she's over on the side and everyone else is like, yeah, like, because a lot of people <laughs> like to be photographed. They mm-hmm. feel seen mm-hmm. and whatever. We photograph ourselves now more than ever. So people are really keen on how to present 
And, you know, that's just like another level that the photographer has to get through. But at least you got willing subjects, maybe a little more so now. And and so then I've seen those people kind of like enter back in. You know, I'll always give them one more check. Like, you sure you don't want to get in this photo? <laughs> you sure? What about when when someone agrees to take a photo and then they, they pose for you? And it's not the, the pose that you were you were thinking. Is there a, a method you might use to kind of encourage them back to the what you originally saw or felt? Um, like Amy, I, 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 I might have an, in, an initial, don't move your head this way. And then after that initial, I usually just allow them to, to present. I just photograph somebody who posed the entire assignment. And what I ended up doing was I had to find moments between the posing. Like I would drop the camera, but still have it here. And as soon as they drop their guard, I go, and then they'll prop back as soon as they hear the click. <laughs> or or you you just tell yourself that this is going to be one of those situations where the, the, the portrait is not the image. It is when they are engaged in whatever else that they're doing. And then you find the portrait within that, th- those series of images. Um, but yes, I have worked with people who they're, they're so in tune with the camera that as soon as the camera goes up there, yeah. they're in model mode. Well, uh, one, yeah, of Avedon's, so uh, regularly, yeah. one of Avedon's tricks, I, I, I knew somebody who was an assistant of his, he would have his subjects walk in, step out onto the psych in his studio, wherever they were shooting. And he would sit in front of the camera alongside with the cable release in his hand. He would say, we're just going to be doing some checking, some lighting before we start. And he said, just relax. And that's why a lot of his pictures, his subjects are just in very casual, unguarded moments because they were just checking lights. And then he would say, okay, we're good. And they'd say, oh, when we, he says, we did it. We're done. We're done. And that was the one of his ways of doing it. Don't let them know you're shooting. Don't even tell them. Well, when I, one of my first, my very first photography project was an in-depth project on, on the world famous Bob and She's a burlesque dancer and had a super strong relationship to the camera. And I wanted from the start to make this really in-depth, intimate portrait of her. And one of my first challenges as a photographer, aside from gaining a complete stranger's trust, was somehow breaking through the strong relationship she had to the camera as a performer. She loved the camera. My, my problem wasn't as it is with most people where they're uncomfortable in front of the camera. She was too comfortable in front of it. <laughs> so eventually when I had built up enough trust, I, I started photographing her in 24-hour periods. So I would like sleep in her be- bed, eat what she ate, go wherever she was going for that 24-hour period. And of course, in 24 hours, like someone is going to stop posing for the camera. So that was how I handled it. And it was really effective in more ways than just that. Um, but on the street, of course, I don't have that sort of time. Um, and and I think that's why working with the iPhone is still part of my practice, because I do see there's a lot of candid behavior in everyday people who are in the public that are just so gorgeous and it's sort of like you're fishing or something, you know, and you just want to make those, those, you know, quick photos. Do you, when you're using the iPhone, do you shoot uh, a continuous shot or do you try to keep it just to the one? You know, you oh, is there, a, can you fire it like a... <laughs> you can keep it that way. <laughs> oh, yeah. can you? Oh, yeah. No, oh, I didn't yeah. know that. It's just a one shot, yeah. You're yeah, I still have, I have an iPhone um, 6 SE, so it's still like the small one, so I don't have the super duper lens. Maybe that's for like the you pluses, can, you can the still, 7. You can just oh, I can't. Finger on it and yeah, that would be a nightmare editing wise. <laughs> I yeah. just can't deal with, that's like, I don't think in terms like that. Yeah. I but I will, so. I mean, I, I would do of... this, you know, because you don't know. Well, you can. Just hang? <laughs> just keep oh, that no. finger on it. Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, just think of yeah, our, my kids that. all <laughs> the hard drives that will be filled up with like so back, many missed moments. Back to the, the money question, because mm. I don't think we answered it. Um, He's a great guest. <laughs> 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 so there, 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 there are two sides to this, the money conversation. One, on assignment, um, I've, I've been asked, you know, especially if the person came via a phone call from the magazine right, or wherever. Right, it's an arranged thing. Yeah. Right. They're, you know, am I going to be paid? And uh, I usually said, I usually say um, for credibility, 
um, you, we cannot pay you because then to, to the audience, your reaction is because you're paid. And that usually, the other side of the money conversation is when I meet somebody who desperately needs money. Um, for instance, some of the guys I photograph, um, people ask, do you give them money after? And I'm saying it publicly, yes. Um, I, consider it, I consider it sharing my lunch. Um, I consider it tithing. I consider it just basic feeding another human being. But you might do that even if you didn't take the picture, though. So uh, I, I, mean, I don't even have to take a picture. Yeah. Um, right. That's a different and, thing. And, yeah. and one of the things I'm also doing is if, if I'm going to give you the money, I don't want the picture. And I, I, I used to, when I, when I was shooting with my iPhone, I had a thing called a dollar portrait. And it was me, I have to admit, selfishly trying to keep my dollar. <laughs> because I knew people would say, no, I don't want my picture taken. So I would go, I get to keep my dollar. And I just, you know, I, I, and again, when you're working, there's something in you that allows for the human to be different. Because now I'm like, you know, an average meal is 10 bucks. I cannot eat today. And I usually, sometimes I'll buy somebody a lunch and not eat. I don't buy you lunch and then go eat. I make that sacrifice count because I also have two boys and they have to eat. So I, I can't feed two boys and you. I be, I'll be the one that don't eat lunch today. And that's how, that's how I live. I mean, it, the money people always ask, is it ethical? Well, it's ethical for me to live within a community and to help, to be a part of that community financially, not just take an image and tell people that I'm using this image to, to speak on behalf of a, a community that is plagued with poverty. No, part of that, I think, is the responsibility and the obligation to, mm -hmm. to ease, even if, if, if it's a day. Mm -hmm. Well, I find some people, and, and this is separate from whether somebody clearly needs money, they'll throw that out as a way to either test you or to push back or, um, you know, are you going to pay me for this? Or, you know, and, and then, you, you know, I would often say, well, no, no, I'm not going to pay. Right. You know, if, it's, it, if it's an image I need, it, it, if it's an image I want, and especially if, I'm, if you're going to talk to me, um, there's, some certain, there's so many ways that I've done this. I've actually given the person the money and said, you can walk away. Yeah. That's a good one. I don't want, I don't want you to stay here just because you know that there's, a, there's money. I so you can walk away right now. And um, if it, thank God most people have stayed. Um, and we talk. We, um, and because it's important to hear. And I can, I can tell when you're lying. I, I've also looked at, at, at young, muscular guys and they've asked me for money and I've had the conversation, dude, you can do better than this. You know, I know that work is not being thrown on the road, but let me know when was the last time you filled out a, a resume. Stuff that, and, and there's no transaction, there's no picture, there's nothing. There's a conversation. And I'm sure they're like, oh man, this Russ, <laughs> as in this, dr this dread, man. And all yeah. I needed was five Preaching bucks, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I feel like, you know, I remember when I first came here when I was 20 years old, I first learned this, the saying, you know, let me not mess this saying up. Um, feed a person, give a person a fish. Yeah. For a day. They're, they're, they're fed for a day. They're fed for a day, but fish. teach them how to fish. Right. And they, I remember when I first moved here, first within the first week, I heard that. Never heard that in Jamaica. That's I don't. That, I, I don't think I heard, I heard it that way. We have mm -hmm. a, a similar. other way of similar way of saying it, but I remember hearing that for the first time, and um, it it is it's one that has stayed. We, we've covered a lot of ground here and, and, and talked about a lot of things I didn't even think we'd even be reaching to. It's been a wonderful conversation. From each one of you, parting thoughts to our listeners on street photography, if you had to give them one piece of advice of how to approach a person, how to carry yourself, some nugget of something to walk away with. What's your takeaway from this? 
if you want to really go in and connect with people. I'll give Amy last, 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 last talk. So I'll go up first. Um, you know, I, I, I studied almost everybody contemporary, like to go, go as far back as who, um, I don't know, Man Ray. I mean, can we go further? Stieglitz. Steichen, go, go back, go back. All the foundations. All stones. the foundations. I mean, I've I've looked at their work, studied their work, and um, I'm not a fan of aimless photography, taking pictures of a palm tree, unless you tell me why. Which is again why I have captions. Like, why? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to tell me? I need to know. I need to know. And I think that's, what, that's why when I go on YouTube and I look at Joel's long conversations about photography, I can appreciate his work so much more because I can strip myself of this skin for a moment and walk inside his skin for a moment and become him. And so... Just looking at his work does not give me the same thing as hearing his voice telling me what was his intent, that word, and what was his purpose. And so if there was a gem to any student or to any amateur or to any professional, I would say that I would love to see more intentional photography, more purposeful photography. People getting up, picking up their cameras and saying, I want to go shoot this today. I want to talk about this today. I want people to know about this today. That kind of stuff. Any uh, photographers that you're looking at right now that you're really in love with? I look at everybody. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of um, Instagram. A big favorite of mine, um, and I will defend him anywhere in this world, Eugene Richards. Mm-hmm. Um, no need to defend. But but people have said that he has gone into the black community and mm, I've um okay. hmm, that's a good question. Good right. Point. And I've talked up and I've shown our our struggle as if it was misery porn. I would defend him any day that I have not met anybody else with a bigger heart. In fact, a part of my journey, a part of this photography that you're looking at, is conversations with Eugene. Um, and I can't even call him Eugene. Um, to me, he's Mr. Richards. <laughs> um, not because, just because I grew up that way. You know, he's my he's my senior. And as much as he'll say, "Ready, don't call me that." Um, he has he's earned it. Um, nobody, I cannot find any black person in this world that has done the kind of work that he has done. And as a result, he will forever have my respect. But that's what I mean by, you know, intent, um, purpose, and be willing to open up your veins to the criticism because it's coming. Mm. Can you well, I t- no, I totally agree <laughs> with Reddy, and I think yeah. that um, I would, I guess, augment that by just saying if you don't know your intention and you know you kind of can't before you just start doing something you can have ideas of your intention but then examine your fears because that's probably going to lead you to what you're all about right because if you're out photographing earnestly you're asking some big questions if you're on the street and you want to interact with people which is the only kind of photography that i can speak to you know, you're, it's a wild, crazy, it's the wild west out there. So, you know, use fear to figure out why you're there. And, you know, sometimes fear is telling you, like, to get out of someplace. But usually it's telling you, like, what you care about and what you feel like you have a lot of stake in. So I would encourage people to, like, you know, think about how they're reacting to their fears in their life. And one of the things that I love about street photography is that 
it sort of taught me how to live in a more courageous way because I just get used to confronting my fear of asking someone to photograph them or photographing them without their permission. So it's just, it's sort of like a very straightforward head-on approach to living that um, is necessary in street photography, but like then also starts just like spreading out into your life in general, that, which is the reason that I'm still so passionate about this this genre called street photography because it's, it, it is a way of life. It, you know, half the time I'm photographing, I don't even have a camera in my hand yeah. <laughs> and I can feel people know that my eyeballs are on them. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I would just, that would be my advice That's, is to I, examine I, that. And I, I would, I'd love to, 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 to know that people who are listening can go on the internet and find 10 black photographers all over the world. Go know 10 black photographers. Ready, Roy, where can people find your work? At R-U-D-D-Y-R-O-Y-E on Instagram. And that will lead you everywhere. Um, I think my website is in my bio. so Or the profile on Instagram. So it's easy to find. Or RoddyRoy.com. Okay. Amy, what about yourself? Yeah. Um, similar, my website is amytushat.com and you can be connected there with, with anything else. You have um, a workshop and a talk? And I do, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I have a workshop coming up August 3rd through 12th um, in New York. It's called Framing New Yorkers mm -hmm. and we're going to be talking about some practical and psychological methods you can use to photographing the street and then we're going to go out photographing together, but mm -hmm. apart, but together, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. all throughout mm -hmm. New York. <laughs> We're gonna like look at other Actually, people's work me, and is is street photography for you something that needs to be solo sola? I mean, is it a solitary thing? For Can me, you work it is. With, yeah. For me, it is. Like, I just I just gave a workshop in Mexico last um, month, and the first they're probably gonna be listening right now. <laughs> Hi, Jill and Dan. <laughs> I was speaking of them and um, and okay. Romy. Um, you know, at first everyone wants to be together because they're scared because the whole workshop was about photographing people and, you know, they're there because they, they need, they're obviously feeling like they want to push what they know. And so, so, you know, I'm, I want everyone to like me, you know, so I was like, okay, we can be in, you know, let's groups, whatever it, for me, I, cause I was ready to unleash. There were photographs <laughs> everywhere in Mexico. So I was just like waiting for that time when we could stop talking and be photographing so I found it really challenging and ended up splitting with my half really quickly. And then anyway, the next day I was like, no one is with anyone. We are all on our own. Let's meet back here. We have, you know, if anyone gets lost, we have our, you know, connections and whatever. Yeah. And ready, any exhibits, any anything um, coming up in that exhibit sense? In, uh, in at Goucher College on the 28th and the 29th. Actually, it opened, it opened yesterday, but I have a talk on the 28th and the 29th. Um, I have a talk at Pratt. Tonight, tonight at six. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're listening to the show, he did have like, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. And um, that's about it, I think. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. I yes, loved hearing from you. Thanks to our guests, Amy Touchette and Ruddy Roy. Go to their websites, check out their work. And on behalf of Amy, Ruddy, Jason, John, and myself, as always, Thank you so much for tuning in today. 